Rated M for Mature. Well, uh, let's get this started. Welcome to uh, Playing Dead Live. I'll be your host, AJ Locasio. All right, so this is going to be an hour-long panel, 35 minutes for discussion, 25-minute Q&A. We'll be joined by Kevin Bruner, the co-founder of Telltale Games. And uh, please hold all your questions to the last 25 minutes with the Q&A. You know, that's how that works. Uh, usually we tape these, and I do a bunch of takes, so I'm going to screw up uh, saying a lot of this stuff, so just embrace that, please. One Playing Dead episode takes, like, the length of ten Playing Dead episodes. Oh, it's so horrible. Right, so. It's really bad. Yeah. It's like, on this episode of Play Walking, it's bad. Anyway, uh, this is an M-rated game, so this is going to be an M-rated panel, so if anybody is under the age of 17 without a parent or a guardian or who is not cool with violence and uh, <laughs> this baby soul. right here, <laughs> get out of here <laughs> with your baby. They're going to soak all this in to start killing. It's bad. Um, <laughs> but if you're offended by cursing, violence, and possibly some male nudity, uh, you should... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's what, I'm, that's what I'm really here for. But please leave now if you're offended by any of that. Uh, we also will not be discussing episode three since it just came out. We don't want to spoil it for anyone. I know. Wow, I've gotten applause. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions about it or you want to talk to anyone about it, uh, talk to the Telltale guys over at the booth. They'll be happy to chat with you. Uh, now let's get this started. Joining me to my right, we've got Jake Rodkin and Sean Vanneman. They are the lead game designers on Walking Dead as well as the beautiful and bored-looking Gary Witta. <laughs> Are you all right? <laughs> Gary wrote uh, episode four. He's also the uh, story consultant on the entire uh, Walking Dead season. And uh, Gary wrote Book of Eli. Am I embarrassing you, Gary? Stop writing notes no, about no, me. No, you wrote Book actually, of Eli? It's important that we show this. This is me writing down no F3 to myself, because they're all in my head, like the same thing. So it's so like don't. no F3, and then Gary added or 405, <laughs> which would be bad. Yeah. Yeah. So then when Lee explodes, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Just, we just said no F5. No, it's a, <laughs> I'm sorry, Clementine, and that's just, it's like the Death Star. Um, all right, let's move on. So, what? Jake and Sean, tell me exactly, what do you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis? What are your responsibilities on walking? I would also like to know that. <laughs> yes, I have no idea what you guys do. It's like our sixth interview together, and I'm like, I still don't know what these guys do. Kevin's actually gonna transcribe everything we say and go, oh, okay, that's what we hired these guys to do. Um, so, uh, Jake and I, Okay, uh, I am generally in charge of sort of the story and writing, but we've done a lot of it together with Gary, um, and we lead the team in sort of how to make some creative choices in the game. I like that game. it sounds like we don't do anything. Yeah, like, really. <laughs> it's just really we are, it's just a lot of work to do. Um, we've kind of divvied, like, at the beginning, of the, at the beginning, at the beginning, uh, when we were talking about making a Walking Dead game, it was kind of just Jake and I in a room um, waiting for somebody to pay attention to us, and then our friend Chuck Jordan was contracted to come in and um, give us some ideas too, which was yeah. awesome. So we sat around for weeks and weeks and weeks with uh, a lot of whiteboards and post-it notes trying to figure out what the hell happens across the season. Uh, and then at some point, people started giving us people to actually make a game, so... Yeah, we pitched we were, a story to Robert yeah. Kirkman and then sat, had lunch with Gary, and we're like, oh, he's a cool dude who likes games and, <laughs> and knows The Walking Dead, and it all just sort of worked out. It was really great. But um, day to day, it's a lot of playing the episodes, uh, giving a lot of direction, giving feedback. Um, I go into like a weird cave if I'm writing. Um, so that's where the real writers are. You whip them and go, there yeah, you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. We've that's constructed a small cave. Yeah. No, I, yeah. You do sort of sit there with headphones just staring at your screen and then if anyone asks you a question, you go, fling <laughs> <laughs> your feces behind really you. It's really goddamn annoying when you're actually trying to Sorry. make stuff. It's like, but, we just want to go to um, lunch. I'm like, oh, God, leave me alone. Yeah. yeah, but um, that's pretty much. That was a. Yeah, terrible I, I, I totally blanked This is out one of those ones we would redo. Yeah, yeah. Sean, Sean and I do the story together, the sort of core design uh, aspects of the game, and then it, we end up splitting up so that Sean writes a lot of script, and I bother a lot of artists and occasionally poke programmers in the eye until something happens, um, <laughs> and then those occasionally switch weirdly. Except that I don't actually write dialogue. Don't ask me to write dialogue in the game. <laughs> wow. All right, let's move on to Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Gary, give us a history of where you come from. You were a games journalist, and you went from that to script writer. How does that? How does one make that transition? I, I still don't know. Um, 
my, the way I did it was kind of mostly by accident. I was very, very, very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time on a number of occasions. But yeah, I was the editor in chief of PC Gamer and grew up loving video games and also loved movies. And um, after having worked on PC Gamer for many years, managed to kind of jack that in and go off and, and go to Hollywood and, and write movies and had, have had some success doing that. Uh, but still, I've always loved video games. It's always kind of been in my DNA. And as obviously, as video games have become more cinematic, and you've seen um, the movies and and video games and TV shows all kind of coalesce and share storytelling disciplines. Uh, it, it, it worked out that I was able to kind of come back and apply what I had learned as a screenwriter back towards you know video games, which is really my first love. And um, Robert Kirkman and I are friends, and uh, I managed to twist his arm uh, when they were shooting the pilot into being a zombie in the pilot episode. It was kind of cool. To be one of the zombies that ate Rick's horse. That was cool. No, wait, wait, wait. I have to stop. Do we have pictures of this? I hear that we have photos someplace. Really? Yeah, Here so that was... There you go. They did, a, they did an amazing job on me. Um, they had so many zombies in the horde scene in that Atlanta pilot. Uh, but as it, And I didn't know what kind of zombie I was going to be. That's like what they call an alpha, which is like full contact lenses, full prosthetic makeup. Uh, and there are zombies that just kind of have these crappy masks that don't look as good that are at the back of the crowd. And I was waiting to be assigned Alpha, Beta, Charlie, whatever kind of zombie. And uh, Greg Nicotero, who is the makeup genius on the show, who also did all the blood and guts for the Book of Eli, so I knew him already. He's like, what are you doing here? I said, oh, Curtin's going to let me be a zombie. I don't know what I'm going to be yet. He's like, come with me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Greg did all the makeup for me personally. And so I got to, be, uh, got to have a really good time. There's a couple of scenes uh, when Rick's being chased through Atlanta in the pilot episode where you get to see me. Uh, pulling down off the horse, so that was pretty cool. And then because of all that, and because Robert and I have the same uh, agent, um, when they were doing the video game and the, the, the comic book license fell to Telltale, uh, somebody called me and said, you should have a conversation with these guys. And initially I was very skeptical because I kind of thought initially that it could be just a, like an act. I didn't know who was developing it. Maybe it's an action game where there isn't really much of an opportunity to tell a story. Uh, but as soon as it said Telltale, I was like, sign me up because I know these guys, I know the kind of stories uh, the kind of games that they make. I mean, it's right there in the title. You know, they tell stories and um, uh, met with, with Sean and Jake and kind of clicked immediately. And they already had a lot of the broad strokes of the story laid down. Uh, so like episodes one and two particularly, I actually had very little input in those. Like the creation of the characters, like Lee and Clementine and the main cast of characters, that's all these guys. Uh, but as we get later into the season, episode three, and particularly four, which I wrote, and five, which I had a lot of input in the story, uh, you'll, you'll see more of my influence in, in the game. Yeah, it was definitely... It was nice because we had been working so insularly for so long, and Gary came in with sort of this barometer of, of horrible for us. <laughs> so everything that we would pitch that was like, oh, maybe we shouldn't go, should go this far. He'd be like, no, you're going, we're going that far, <laughs> which is uh, great. I think it, like the game wouldn't really be where it is when it's on its high notes. Yeah, I, think, without, I really without that sort of like, oh, I guess we should. I go. really, my my thing, I guess, was kind of bring like the most uh, our perverted horrible, miserable things I could think of. Um, uh, you know, drawing heavily on my own life experience, obviously. <laughs> and life at PC Gamer is rough. I actually got the greatest, one of the greatest compliments in my career came just this week because we were in the dialogue booth with uh, um, Dave Fenoy, who plays Lee, uh, and he was reading, so he was reading my dialogue for episode four, and at one point he put the script down and said, you are one sick motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> does I want to hear Lee say that. He said, does your mama know you're writing this shit? And I was like, I was, I was like thank you so much. It's the greatest <laughs> I could receive. Um, but when we, were, when we were breaking some of the story elements for three, four, and five, I would pitch them a lot of things, and again, these guys would kind of recoil, like, what the fuck are you what? <laughs> it's horrible. But, but then as we, what we did, obviously if there's one franchise, one property that gives you the opportunity to do that, it's the Walking Dead universe. Because, you know, the comic and the TV show is just going to beat you up on a regular basis emotionally. It's like, how miserable can we possibly make you? So we felt like we had the license to do that with the game also. And we discovered really initially that our, whenever somebody around the table, not just me, would pitch something that made us go, I don't know if we could do that. That that was like, well, no, we we have to. Now we must. That's because just, if that yeah. is the reaction that we're getting, that's the reaction that we want to instill in the player as well. They're like, oh my god, I can't believe they went there. And no. So hopefully, it's, uh, especially in four and five. Again, without any spoilers, if you think three is bad, <laughs> uh, four and five. Oh, it's uh, not that bad. I'm scared. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's gonna be fun. Now, not to derail us too much, but I have to. I heard a story with you involving a horse and anal beads. Is this? Uh, oh, not that story again. You have to tell real quick. Make it quick. okay. Just, just real, real quick because it's not really about the game. But just, like, anyway, this panel's ready. I told this story. Ready to I told you. Get that baby out of here. I, oh, it's I, Gary's baby. I told this story once, and it now it's going to dog me forever. 
Um, I don't know, because it would never even broadcast. They did, You're like, making it worse, just so you know. Just, okay, just, <laughs> just, just real, real quick. Um, so when we did that horse scene, um, the, they put this rubber horse on the ground, and the Greg Nicotero guys are all coming over with like their stage blood, and you know, trying to make, make it as gory as possible. And they give you all these kind of weird stuff. Like, they give you these condoms that they fill with blood. And they say, well, look, stick your hand inside the horse's guts with the condom in it. And as you pull your hand out, squeeze, and the blood will explode, and it'll just look really gross, and you'll, you'll get a good blood effect. And so we did a few takes, and they kept coming over and saying, more intensity, like, we really fight each other over those horse guts, like you're really hungry zombies. And so we were kind of tearing up. And at one point, we had these fake rubber intestines. And I was kind of wrestling with this other guy. We had him like, ah, like this. And at one point, like, the rubber coating came off, and there's like a string of pearls underneath. <laughs> and somebody said, I, I think these are anal beads. <laughs> All right, I think that's the end of that story. <laughs> As I say, you are visibly uncomfortable right up there, right here. Just like, oh god, make it stop the condoms and the blood. We tried to warn you. Yeah, alright, moving on. So, how did this... <laughs> now we're talking about Just bone. forget that happened. Yeah. So, how, how did this project begin? Who approached who about making this? Uh, where did this start? Um, I think... God, was it like Comic-Con? The, like, story, the story that I heard was that someone from Telltale approached uh, Image and Skybound on the show floor of Comic-Con saying, are you guys interested in a video game? And then it sort of went from there, I mean. Yeah, it was sort of, it was somebody like identifying, hey, that totally works for our studio. And then I remember um, there was the compendium sitting in our uh, like head of marketing's office one day and I walked by and did like a, like a double take and walked in and like in a big sticky note, let's say, I said like, get this and just put it <laughs> on the thing. And then, yeah, just kind of, I think we went back and forth. And obviously like because the comic book like the, zo the zombies and the killings, like the killing of zombies or just the de defense and all that, is you just blast through those pages. You know, you, you, they're really beautiful and really well rendered, but it's the human on human stuff. I mean, we've talked about this a ton, but that's really the stuff that's really the meat of The Walking Dead. And, you know, our studio is just yeah, set up to do that. Like, that I is think what the, re we do. the reason this thing exists at all is because the, you know, we, we pitched, I think we, we sent those guys some of the stuff we had done in the past, and we sent them some of the just other things that we liked that were visually similar and sort of in our wheelhouse and said, here's the sort of game we want to make, story and character, uh, weird, crazy choice stuff, and then occasionally you crush a guy's face and it looks sick, but that's not really what you do all the time, and uh, I think that they thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah, you just kind of take for granted that the cool zombie stuff is going to be there, and, and Sean's absolutely right. Like, certainly when I was writing episode four, the stuff that I enjoyed the most was the stuff where I kind of forget that I'm writing a zombie story at all. And yeah. It's just a human drama. That's a good you, point. you go through long periods where zombies don't show up because you don't want to overdo it. Zombies constantly attacking, it starts to get old, and you know the, the, the specialness of that is lost. But we let you forget almost that zombies are around, and then when they attack, you go, oh shit, zombies. Like, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but really, and Robert Kirkman certainly understands this, and I think everyone that's had a successful iteration of The Walking Dead, I think, you know, hopefully us also, get that the zombies really are incidental. They really are just there to create the vice that squeezes these humans into these horribly dramatic, agonizingly, emotionally, you know, problematic situations and, and see and just see how long they go before they break. Um, and so the, the zombies really are there, I think, just as kind of this crucible that we throw humans into. They're very cool because they eat people and they look cool, but um, I, I think they really are secondary to what we're trying to do. So what was Kirkman's, like, when you guys first presented this to him, what was his reaction? Or like, what did he say? Like, you have to have this? Or like, how did he respond to this? It's gotta have zombies in it. It's gotta have zombies. <laughs> uh, it's funny, like, he's not the most effusive guy. He's really kind of thoughtful and like, he's, he's gregarious, but he's, we pitched him the story. Remember that? He's like, that sounds, like, that sounds, that sounds about right. <laughs> and we went, yeah. uh, okay. okay and he went, yeah. Uh huh. I just feel like The Walking Dead to me. We talked for maybe a couple more minutes. Then we, Kevin was there. We like ate some pad thai and <laughs> we'll admit your game. But like, you know, it's then it's like that was like the first pitch, you know. And then it's right. sort of as we've been. Oh no, he had one note. He's like, oh, he did. Uh, that Frank guy, name him something else. Don't call him Frank. So we renamed him Kenny. He's like, oh, that's Kenny's fine. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and I think that was a testament to like we'd obviously done a lot of due diligence about making it feel like what we thought the comics felt like. And also, he's been incredibly this sort of, he set it all up to succeed and then sort of said, I believe in this, go. You know, and... Uh, we hear really, really yeah. nice stuff when episodes come out where he's just like, holy shit. I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> good. Yeah. I love to imagine him playing <laughs> yeah, it, just yeah. like, yeah. 
Yeah, so that, it's been, well, you know, it's been really great. It's actually interesting. I think about that sometimes. I think about the fact that he knows the general gist of our story, but he, like, he, he doesn't know all of the super intimate details, and I'm sure, Ooh. you know, the intimate, the intimate details. details. But it's, it's got to be kind of weird to be that guy, to be playing this game that you've, you've given your blessing to and that you've heard the pitch and you like it. Like, we've shown him demos of the game and, and at, the, at times, and we've got Gary here and stuff, but, like, to a certain degree, like, compared to the comic book and the TV show, which he, like, he writes every line of dialogue. He's in the writer's room for the TV show. He's a producer on it. Like, there's got to be times when Robert Kirkman is playing something that says The Walking Dead on it, and then just goes, holy shit! And that's, that's awesome for me, like, just to think about that. Uh, so hopefully that happens. I think the thing that really has allowed these guys to... Um, really fly with this. And it was really kind of the conceptual genius of just telling a totally original story within the universe and not feeling shackled to telling Rick and Shane and Laurie's story all over again. Obviously the TV version is very much an adaptation of the comics and they've given themselves some license to kind of go off the main spine of the story. But it's basically, you know, the, the same story beat for beat that you saw in the comics. Uh, and I don't, I don't think anybody really wanted to play a slightly different version of that again. And so to come up with Lee and Clementine and this totally different you know, cast of characters has been very, very liberating. You know, we can chart our own course, we can do whatever we want, we, we can and do and will kill anybody we like. Uh, there are no sacred <laughs> cows because they're established in the comic books and have to live for a longer time. Um, and, you know, so, and so the only thing that we have to stay truthful to is the tonal quality of the universe, the fact that it is bleak uh, and the mythology of the universe uh, and like things like we can't just jump 10 years forward in time because Robert hasn't established where the Walking Dead universe is in 10 years. So there are some parameters, but they're kind of mythological and tonal parameters. There are no story or character parameters at all, except when occasionally a character from the comics may cross over into our story. Obviously, that has to remain canon. Uh, but for the most part, we have much more latitude to create a story than, than a, a licensee that, that took the actual storyline uh, may have had. So what kind of like initial stuff did you guys have? What kind of... You know, you have these this established world. Obviously, you had to feel your way through to come up with new characters, a new story. That must have been hell. Like, how did you? It was really <laughs> fun, actually. Yeah, it was super fun. About this a little yeah. bit more, but like, it definitely. Actually, Clementine was one of the first things that showed up. Like, she was in stories all the way back to yeah. when it was like it was Clementine and her brother, who was this sort of slightly washed up broish dude who got in over his head. Yeah, it was about it was Clementine. Weird, it was like, original. Well, I can actually tell you. I remember exactly how it, how it okay. fell down because you were because I remember you were the one who, who sniffed out what was wrong with it. Um, it was originally Clementine, and Clementine was like a really self indulgent creation. By the way, I was like, oh, this is it was the first thing, but um, it was Clementine and her brother. And the idea was is that their dad was never around and uh, their mom was estranged. And he was like 26, 27, and just taking care of his little sister. Um, and they, but they were like many years apart in age. This was like well before we had any art or character designs or anything. Yeah, we, have, sort of we had that one concept of, art of the stairs. Yep, oh yeah we, had, yeah, we had one drawing of stairs with a zombie at the bottom. Really, it's really it's, cool. It's actually it's, still a really cool yeah, it's really thing. Cool. It's really enigmatic. But, uh, and the issue was, we kind of talked about it, and we came around and around on it, was, uh, and I had written sort of the first five minutes of the game where that was the case, and like, you're asleep in your bed, but it's like the afternoon, because you were like working all night, and you live in this old country house, it's sort of like ramshackle and falling apart, and you guys can't put any money into it, and Clementine comes and wakes you up and says, like, this guy is being weird, and you're like, Earl, I think it was the guy's Earl, down the street, yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> then uh, you go, what? And he goes, yeah, he, like, he was being weird, he like chased me. And uh, he pulled my hair. He pulled my hair, and then your character, like, your character, sits up and goes, "Oh!" And then you, your first choices come up, and it's like, "I'm gonna beat the shit out of this guy," or like, "What? That doesn't sound like Earl," and all this stuff. But it turns out, you know, Earl's obviously a zombie, and coming down, you know, it's the first zombie you see, and it's this one encounter. He comes to your house and is like knocking on the door. Uh, so that we like that. That sounds cool, right? <laughs> um, but the issue was, was having, uh, I think the guy's name was Jim. Yep. Like, it was having the brother in Clementine as they already had all this history and all this baggage, they were family. Have they, it was too much to ask you guys, or just the players, to take on. Like, how are we gonna get all this backstory out? How are we gonna get the story of the mom? Like, like oh, I wish mom was here. Like, how do you get all that stuff out? It's just way too, it's, it's such a, like, a, just too big of a writing task. And just, it doesn't, it's not fun. So we wanted a character with baggage, but we wanted him to be somebody new. Um, and we still really like this little girl. So Lee kind of was born out of pragmatism. I think actually Lee you know? at some point turned, it was a completely different story. That we said, okay, what if you're this other guy who's this college professor and stuff? And then at some point when we were having a story meeting, we said, oh, what if you just 
what if this car accident happens and then you come over a hill and you run into Clementine? We're like, oh, Clementine! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember her. So, and then that was, we sort of had a couple threads that slowly got woven together into that. Also, let the record show. Oh, God, we can't talk about episode three! <laughs> Nothing's uh, in that episode. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, every, you should definitely get it. You should definitely buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really good. It's really good. But I wanted to talk about something so disingenuous, super so awesome that I can't job. talk about. You totally saw the note. I know. Oh, I think that I, I think that Lee Clementine relationship is by far the most amazing thing that these guys have created with the story, and it's certainly the part of of. of of the whole thing that I felt most pressure and most responsibility as it was handed to me to write episode four was that being being true to that relationship uh, because it's not easy to do. Uh, you know, I love the idea of this guy that was you know not not a father, not ready to be one, and yet and yes, kind of become one anyway through through necessity. Um, and in particular, the the um, the creation of Clementine, which I think you know the way that these guys do it, there's three elements, there's voice acting, there's writing, and then there's kind of the facial animation and the visual aspect. And they all have to come together and create a true character. And with, with children, it's particularly difficult to do, because in film and television and in, in video games also, you know, the, it's very easy for children to kind of fall into that trap of being precocious and irritating, yeah. and you just yeah. kind of want you, them to die. You don't like, know like, how, like... She can't <laughs> sound smarter than she is. That's, you know, she, like, yeah. that's always every movie. It's Dakota like, oh, Friday. that kid is so smart. I, I feel know. like up until about the day before we started pitching the design to people, you and I were like, do we keep Clementine in the game? Is she just going to be the yeah. most bratty, annoying thing? Is everyone going to hate this kid? Or is the forums just going to be filled with people saying, I want to kill this stupid little girl sidekick? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> like, escort mission, like, whatever. But, and we're like, yeah, no. We're so, and even when, uh, first, you know, when the first auditions came in, and we were like, oh, my God, what are we Gonna do? What are we gonna do? Well, oh my god! We, and we all by that point we were across the Rubicon with Clementine. Well, like right, we weren't, we, yeah. we weren't designing her out of the game. Right. And just the at, idea. At of, first, oh. it's because we said maybe we should try casting a girl who's actually Clementine's age, and just let's see it. Let's see if it works. And all of them sounded exactly like little girls, but because we, we were like, there's no way we're not just gonna get like some woman to play a girl. Blame. <laughs> oh my God, Melissa Hutchinson's audition is so good, but all these, uh, but she's yeah. an adult, but these little girls are not that, okay, it's her, and then, yeah. thank God, um, but yeah. yeah. I first met the woman that played uh, Clementine uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were doing VO, and she's a grown woman, I'm like, what? This isn't Clementine, and she would go watch, and she would do the voice, and I'm like, ah, it's freaking me out. <laughs> That's weird. And I would have to sit, we would sit in the other room, and you can see them through the through the soundproof glass doing oh, the voice, but I had to look the other way, because yeah. it was too weird seeing that voice come out of her. And what yeah. else has she done? She's done a bunch. It wasn't she like Edna Strickland? Or yeah, she's Edna Strickland in the back of the like, games. What? People who play the Sam and Max game, she's Stinky, the w diner waitress. Yeah. It's bizarre. So, it's so strange. Scoops. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I have to ask, what is the like to you guys? What is the point of Clementine? I mean, obviously you put a kid in there <laughs> what for is a the reason. Point? Why does Why does she <laughs> exist? She in there? This is not some existential question. Like, why did you guys put her in there? What does there's, she do? There's a really. I mean, can we just all the way back? I think that we what we actually said is people are playing this who play video games. If we just make you a strong, able-bodied adult male, why the hell would you actually stick around with, with all these, of these fucked yeah, up people? That's exactly what why it was. would you not just yeah. bounce and want to leave all the time? And we said, okay, well, if we can make this girl who is in your care and make people actually care about them, which was a huge risk. If we can actually yeah. create suspension of disbelief in a video game, maybe someone will actually believe that they should stick around and deal with all this insane stuff because there's a little girl who actually matters. Whereas if you're just a dude, you're just video game dude man. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you think of an, especially if you think of an asset to a group like this, it's like, once everything, because you know everything gets horrible. Like episode two, everybody's just depressed and starving. Like if you're, <laughs> you know, Lee, who's 37, like pretty able-bodied, you've got it, you're just gonna opt out. You know, guys, uh, I'm just gonna make my own way. So I mean, yeah, that's it's, exactly and, what, yeah. And, and it really is a astonishing to me to look at reviews and look at people on, on forums talk about how they're related to the characters in the game. And I, I think it's great that, you know, most of these, in the, most of these games, these post politics type stories are about personal survival. And yet here is a game where you mostly are concerned with the survival of someone else. You really, your job is to kind of take care of this precious package, this little girl. And it's not just about her physical survival, right. it's about her it's emotional survival. survival. It's like, even if this ever ends, which of course it won't, uh, but even if the situation ever gets better, what's going to be left of this little girl at the end? The horrible things that she's seen and witnessed, is she even going to be you know, a viable, emotional human being at the end of it? And to see people talk about it, how you know, I'll do anything to protect this little girl, and I get vaguely threatening messages from people, you better not hurt Clementine. <laughs> That's all me. <laughs> they really, it's actually, really. It's actually, just Melissa Hutchinson. The, the, yeah. The, <laughs> the degree. Yes, yeah, so I want to be in season two. The degree to which people feel 
protective towards that girl in a real way, in a real yeah, emotional it is, impact. It is, is, I think, absolutely unprecedented in video games. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. How you better not do anything to this collection of polygons with a JPEG. Yes. Yeah, Bush, mush, mush. <laughs> <over front. laughs> like what? I reset yeah. my PlayStation over that. Like I, I can't read the text on my. I have a four by three TV. It's, it's horrible. What? And uh, yeah, I know. So sometimes I can't read what it says, and I'll choose the wrong option, and it's like fuck off, Clementine. And I'm like, get a twenty percent. Because then you're just going in the like back, little, and that'll be it. Like black and white like grandma kitchen TV. You're playing. Yeah, like, no, it's yeah, literally yeah. just like it's me against the screen, and no matter how close play, you are, you can't see it. It's horrible. What? I'm actually playing on a watch. I, really I was gonna say you're it's, playing on a TV, and like you're, it's like in a like a convenience store in 1987. Yeah, no, it's, with my face against yeah, the window. AJ has his PS3 wired up it's, to the like uh, the TV analog input on a Game Gear. It's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. But anyway, yeah, no, I'll literally like get upset and like. I guess you can't say rage quit, like fear quit, Clementine quit, yeah. uh, out of that because yeah, I'm like, I just told Clementine to jump off a cliff I know you're a little technologically behind, behind, but you know that when you turn the TV off, the game is still actually running? That, you know, I was wondering about that. Yeah, that's, back that's, and that's just tapping his foot. Yeah, that's what's going on. Let's move on. So how do you, <laughs> so, you know, the, one of the risks you run with writing a child is them being really irritating. I mean, that's part of the, you know, thing <laughs> of having kids. <laughs> well, that's what I was just saying. Yes. How dare you, Gary. Sorry, right I just clear my throat. Like, I didn't want to give him Some food. Some people like, really like dies. duck. Actually, where's That's, Steve Gainer? Steve wrong? Gainer Steve likes, likes duck. duck. Yeah. Does anyone here like duck? Duck. Oh. Yeah. Don't say no. Yeah. It's like 15 people. You know, right. there was just a duck, like, fist dap that happened. <laughs> 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 uh, what was the but question? But that is the thing, right? I mean, just to get back to and then when kids, we kind of just talked, we talked about it a second ago, but... We, it was some real fear. Like I don't think I don't know, Kevin, if we expressed it to you so much because we, we, didn't, want, we, didn't, want, we didn't want you guys to we didn't want to lose, the flames lose, of fear. Yeah, to lose confidence in us. But it's basically if Clementine Lee doesn't resonate episode one, it's gonna be a long season. Yeah. You know, it's just gonna be like, well, this looks We're like somebody's getting eaten in like you know episode two. Just new characters. <laughs> you yeah. do that. Yeah. If you don't, I mean, if you, don't, if you don't believe that, believe in that little girl and don't care about that little girl, nothing matters, right? Because the whole show, the whole season is really be built around that relationship. Um, so it's amazing. And I tell you, it's amazing to me, even just like my own perspective on it, like I, I became a father halfway through writing episode four. Your and perspective totally changed. It did. Yes. It was amazing. I, I sent Sean an email saying, by the way, episode four now ends with Lee and Clementine on a tropical island with unicorns and nothing bad <laughs> ever happened to her, ever. Your Grinch heart grew ten parents, sizes. Parents will tell you, and I, I bumped into Jerry from Penny Arcade at Comic Con, and we were talking about this as his own perspective. Like, yeah, after I had kids, my perspective on writing about that relationship changed. Parents will often, often told me that after, uh, after they become parents, they can't watch TV shows or movies where children are put in peril. They just can't handle it. And uh, I was like, come on, it's just movies. But then you, it happens to you and you, you're like, oh shit, yeah. So like, <laughs> if, the Lee, if the Lee Clementine relationship suddenly seems much more keenly felt in the second half of episode four, you will know the, you'll know the <laughs> you'll reason why. You'll see it a quick turn. <laughs> yeah. So Gary, uh, you come from obviously a, a little bit of a different background with writing screenplays and whatnot. Can you tell us what is the difference between writing you know, a screenplay for a movie or a TV show versus a video game. And this has obviously got a lot more layers because yeah. you have... Aside from the fact that you have ads. to write two phone books instead yeah, of... Yeah, basically. Uh, there's a I lot mean, going on there. It's, it, the whole experience has been a tremendous. I've done consulting and, and some writing on video games before, but nothing to, to this level of depth where I've been involved in every... I mean, the last few weeks I was in Telltale's office every day writing in their proprietary script writing tool. I was in all the VO sessions. So really, really closely involved. And... Um, it's been a tremendous learning experience for me. First of all, just on a conceptual level, like Sean and Jake, who are great kind of uh, story <laughs> cops and gameplay cops. <laughs> yeah, they're just great. Um, but I would, I would come in and pitch them like a really cool story moment. They'd be like, yeah, that's cool. But like, what is there for the player to do? Because they're aware of the fact that you're serving two masters as a gameplay master and a story master. And they both have to kind of be in, very, in this very fine balance. And like, they have an incredible, incredibly, like they watch what, what, everything that players do through a microscope, because it's all online. Everything, all the data, and at a really granular level, gets reported back to. Like you see how the stats are reported at the end of each episode. Like you know how many uh, punches Lee throw or whatever. They also know how long you can go without player interaction before players start to tune out and go away. And it's really, really short. It's like 15 to 20 seconds. If you haven't given the player something to do, some reason to feel like they're they have agency or they're they're really playing Lee then they'll start to tune out. And oftentimes, like my first draft, I would just have Lee assert himself and say, well, we're gonna do this, or I don't like you very much. And like, 
And Sean would just go through because this needs to be a player choice. Why isn't this a player choice? Why isn't the player making this decision? And you realize you can't have Lee. And Lee can kind of like do minor things, but any time where you feel like if I'm Lee, I might have done something different, that has to be a player choice. And so you have to write, you know, three or four different ways that the story can branch, even if it's just for a brief time before it comes back to the spine. Every single time Lee does something of any consequence at all. So simply by volume. You're writing way, way much. I mean, I did like a word count, page count, and it was roughly the, a little more, a little over the equivalent of like two feature-length films for one episode. So by volume, you're writing a lot more. Um, and then what is really crazy is the way that you, in no, way, in no kind of writing that I've ever done before, like breaking story, there's a certain amount of logic involved. But when you're dealing with all the different, uh, there's, there's a scene, and again, no spoilers, but there's a scene in episode four that is so crazily consequential and branching. It's like, okay, but so in episode three, Lee said this, and then this flag got triggered, and this happens, then this has to happen, or otherwise this happens, or this happens. And there's so many different ways to, to you have to write it that by the time it was done and we had every single consequence flagged and we understood all the different ways that the scene, scene could play out, I had to go like, lay in a dark room for like half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> because it was like, oh my yeah. God, that was a nightmare. One thing that I remember when we were talking about story stuff, especially late in the season, um, and I think Gary, that this came in part from you doing more sort of feature stuff, is that you would always you would you would often say, "Oh, this is the best version of it right here. This is awesome," and then it'd be like, "Oh God, okay, Gary thinks this one's the best. Now we have to make the other three also the best, yeah, because yeah. they're all there. Like yeah, it's yeah. not, we, you know, we 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 have this situation where we'd be like, oh, so, so this happens, or this happens, this happens." And so and that, then your, your instinct was always, oh, pick the one that you, th that you respond to the most strongly, which is awesome. But then we always, that, then I know Sean and I would always have to go, oh, Gary only likes one out of the three. Your, your approach was always like, oh, this is awesome. We got this, we got this main channel right here. And then Sean and I were sitting there going, okay, we got one quarter of the way And that was the other thing I learned is you can't ever really construct a player choice where one is clearly the way you would go and the other one is kind of the dumb choice. They all have to be kind yeah, of equally weighted. You have to figure weighted. out how to get yourself equally excited about four insane different um, things. When, when, they get the, when they get the stats back, they ultimately want to see as close to a 50-50 split as possible, which is to suggest that there isn't, there isn't any obvious solution. Uh, and so again, in episode four, there are ch there are choices that you know, and you, you look at the choice and you think, well, maybe this looks kind of two seventy thirty right now. What can we do to weight yeah, it back to fifty fifty as much as possible? Let's change these el these elements and try to make it as agonizingly difficult. Pick your poison as possible. And uh, uh, absolutely, anytime we're like, well, clearly you would yeah. do this. Like anytime we would argue, like, no, you would do this. No, you would do that. We're like, great, this is the part game we want the players. Yeah, to that's the best. Whenever that's when you know you've got a good choice. When everyone in the writers' room starts getting into really heated arguments where everyone's annoyed at each other about, like, well, that's obviously stupid because of this. And someone else is like, well, it totally makes sense because this happens. You're like, okay, write that down. And that's what this guy would say. That's what this guy would say. And like, that's you know. That's fine, but yeah, yeah as far as the 50-50 thing, that is totally what we go for. When episode one came back and after a week, it was like, middle, 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 yes, 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 Doug Carly. We're like, damn it, damn it. <laughs> I, tr I tried to tell him, I said, guys, I think the players are going to choose the hot chick over the fat dude. What? They're like, no, it's no, no, hey. Doug's really good with technology. He's like, hey, Doug, hey, like, Doug, no, hey, Doug. where are you at? Or is Doug here? here? Doug I here? saved Doug. So. No, no. No, not who no. saved Doug. Who Wait, is Doug? Over there, someplace. Is Doug tobacco Doug. here? Oh, what? Did Doug not show up? I'm spot. Yeah. Maybe he's hiding. Whatever. Okay, so, so you're going to walk around PAX and you're going to see a guy who looks shockingly similar to the guy in the game. And actually, he's wearing the barrel oak shirt that Doug is wearing in the game. He was wearing it today. today. He's just hoping so, uh, someone will recognize him. We're only making him wear that shirt. He, he's, yeah, we'll take the dragon. <laughs> yeah, our, good, I mean, our good friend Doug Tobacco uh, is cosplaying at PAX today as Doug because he is Doug. <laughs> like, he so, had to like, sign uh, over. He had to like, sign over yeah. his. Like re a release awesome. for his visage, yeah. and, and you everything. can see it there in episode one. By the time you get to that point, where you've got to make that choice. Which one you're going to say? Those characters are established as both could be very useful assets to the group. Carly because she's very good yeah, at the gun. Doug because he's good with technology. But again, all things being equal, yeah. it then comes down to yeah, I'm going to pick the, the 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 thing where I think there might be like kind of a cool romance down the road, as opposed to this dude over here yeah. and, <laughs> and I said I'm telling you it's going to be way Carly yeah, it's, no, it's no, like no. 78 20 76 14 or something so oh, you no, guys not four. Four. <laughs> it was that <laughs> doesn't like those. somebody managed to kill both of them uh, yeah we, uh, we felt like we left some of White Doug is awesome on the table yeah so we actually talked about that apologies to Doug week. lovers everywhere and there is Doug. a team Doug to be fair there are people that like Doug I think it's good I yeah. like there's yeah. a team Doug the people yeah that's right Doug yeah. it's just me I'm team Doug Great. the people who saved Doug, Doug are very passionate about their choice to save Doug. So Doug, Doug Boosters, we salute you. <laughs> also, I got to say Doug Boosters. Doug Bo that's weird. So uh, 
Pretty with all those stats and everything, do you guys use that to screw with people? You're like, ah, everyone chose this. Now we're going to do uh, the complete it's, opposite. Uh, we, I don't, you don't want to be the hoodwinky game. You know, we don't want to be the game where it's like, oh, we we have the upper hand because we know people are playing it. So, oh, this is really going to get them. You know, I don't, I think that's ultimately pretty cheap. So, you know, but I, it's, we're looking more for sort of behavior stuff and sort of things that can be emblematic of future choices. You know, like a good one, a really good one, episode two um, is... Uh, Andy and Danny St. John and uh, you there's a guy is it Danny with the pitchfork okay. yeah. yeah yeah so you've got Danny at pitchfork point and he's the first of the brothers that you encounter and you can off him and a lot of people are just like fuck yeah yo this is <laughs> boom <laughs> pitchfork and then Clementine sort of wanders <laughs> out of the shadows and everybody's like oh my gosh so then when they get to when Andy, they get to Andy yeah. they don't do that like, because they're remembering, like, oh, I felt really bad when I killed that guy with that pitchfork. They're like, oh, come on, that's But actually, best <laughs> stat, really quick about that, we know how many times people have punched uh, Andy in the face, but also we know, like, punch one, two, three, four, five, six, and it's like when you get X number of punches in, the camera, like, the system is like, okay, they've been beating up this guy for a while. Cut to the wide shot of your entire crew just sort of, like, watching you beat <laughs> yeah. this guy's face, and the punches, and we have the, the Excel documents, like, Everyone, 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 uh, not that many people, uh, nobody. So, like, once yeah. it's like, oh, oh, I'm not a little kid, you guys are watching this. Like, yeah. people just, oh, they just stop, which is awesome. And, you know, it's, like, it's important also to know, like, I think it's not about it, like, those people are judging, like, we don't want people to feel like they're playing the game poorly, or they're, like, they're, we're, we want to set up scenarios where you don't feel like the game is judging you, and especially, like, Clementine's not judging you. She's just sort of, like, absorbing, yes, she right? Is. She's judging oh, she's me. judging you, right? She's judging me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She says, buy it's, a new TV, AJ. Um, <laughs> we want, we want and, to uh, like everything that you do is not necessarily good or bad, but it's valid. You should be able to justify it to yeah. your, like, your friends, you know? It's valid, like, oh, I played the game, and this is why I made the choice yeah, now. Yeah, I, think, justify it. I think one of the benefits of doing an episodic game is that you know, the game is, is out there as they're continuing to develop it. So it is interesting to see the stat reporting and also go on forums and see how people respond to different characters. And you can, to some extent, look at that and go, oh, maybe if players really like this, we might do a little, appreciate it a little bit more this way or that way. But we, I, we certainly don't let that push us in any right. major direction. Like no. We knew the, 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 the ending of the season was known and decided upon before episode one shipped. And it hasn't changed and it will not change. And I don't think any amount of player hemming and hawing about you know, what they see in yeah, no, so I, we're, we're, Well, maybe we should change it. No, the ending is, is I think it's locked because it's crazy to try and please yeah. the if audience. Anything, or you can try to just please yourself about. and hope that the audience is, is there with you. Yeah. I think if anything, it's been just kind of validating where we watch people playing, oh, oh thank God. Oh, thank God. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Okay, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> because like, if, if there was ever a time when the, where we just saw some, like if an episode came out that was like 0, 100, 0, 100, 0, 100, we'd be like, okay, we got to rethink some stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, we just use scenarios, that data to make like emblematic choices for it. It's kind of what right. I'm ultimately trying to say. It's like, oh, what does it mean that Clementine's here for this choice? Things right. like that. You know, we're not like, oh, it's not like a one to one yep. end around sort of sort of deal. It's not a one to one end around. Not a one to one end around. That's that. whatever they mark. But, like, right. then, but yeah, we knew the end of the season before I wrote the first word of dialogue for episode one. So. Take yeah, that absolutely. for what it's worth. <laughs> no, 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 again, there are some, there some questions. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you right here. Actually, oh, yeah. Yeah. I feel like stop I see AJ Jesus. shuffling around. He's hitting next on my PowerPoint. Yeah. He's, um, he's so we actually, we're gonna open it up to you guys now. We're gonna do the Q and A, where we'll be joined by Kevin Bruner, the co-founder of Telltale Games, executive hey. producer on Walking Dead, and CTO, whatever that means. <laughs> All right, so how does this work exactly? How are we going to get people to ask questions? We got a microphone. Yay! I guess raise your hand. Have you like dance if up? you have a question? Oh, I see what you're doing. We got to make a dance. My question Order. actually has to do with the voice acting element of it. Um, I've been a longtime fan of Telltale ever since Bone and basically throughout the entire history Sweet. of Telltale. Um, Thank you very much. Because adventure games are my favorite type of game, and Telltale is a perfect example of why it's still an important genre. So... You know, that's why I've been a big supporter of you guys. Um, my question uh, is, how, how much did you factor into when you were casting? Um, like, when you got auditions, it's like, oh, this person sounds like Lee, or oh, this person definitely sounds like Kenny. You know, the connection between the script and the character, it's like, oh, well, 
yeah, well, the, the way this guy sounds, this is obvious as a person. We're going to have to do it. We're right. I, yeah, that's thing. a great question, actually. There are, some, there are some characters in the game where we straight up were like, this dude who we know from previous Telltale stuff, you are already just straight up cast as this guy. But usually our audition process is... We put out, the, we send out the casting sheet with the character photo and some sample lines of dialogue, and then all like all the regular guys who are on the Telltale stuff and on The Walking Dead, both because it said The Walking Dead on the box and because we deliberately cast a wider net, we got a lot of people in. But we end up for every part just listening through three or four dozen auditions. Yeah. Um, it's actually a good story about Lee, um, and this is like a good story about Lee. Yeah, casting Lee. Um, we originally cast somebody who isn't Lee. Like we cast a guy, recorded the whole first episode, and we're like, oh, this isn't working. And that was like uh, that was a bold move for us. Yeah, also. that was we never, I don't, we ne never done that before. And uh, meanwhile, uh, we made an iOS game based on uh, on Law and Order, and there was a really small team like churning out like seven episodes of really really fast on iOS, and they're really cool. It's a really kind of like fun digestible game. And uh, this guy Javier, who's a cinematic artist, kind of says like, "Oh, there's a guy in Law and Order who's really good." And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, put in my email. And then I went like, well, let me actually hear this guy. And we walked over and listened to him. And was like, oh my god, that guy is perfect. And that's Lee. Actually, it's a Dave. I Fennel. forgot that. I forgot that yeah. Dave Fennel was in Law and Order. He was just discovered by available on iOS guy. platforms and PC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So you know, it's like it's a lot of gut. I mean, you know, you Gary um casted uh, a lot of stuff for episode four just because Jake and I have been so overwhelmed. I know you were part of the casting process. So, like you just kind of listen and. You close your eyes and see if you can see it coming out of the character that's already been, you know. Yeah, we had some. Built. There, there were some new characters to show up in episode four that we had to cast, you know, from scratch, and uh, you know, major characters. And so you want to get the voice exactly right, and um, it's easy to whittle down the ones that are clearly wrong from the ones that you like. Uh, but once you get down to like, the last three finalists, and there's really very little daylight between them, it's really, really hard to pick. Yeah. And you often don't know until you really get them in the booth. And like we had, like we do callbacks, like we, there's. Like we haven't come back and do like more emotional stuff. Like let's see what kind of range you've got. But it's it's really really tough. And I discovered that uh, like voice actors don't have headshots because you know, often what they look I like do. is no no indication obviously what the voices they can do. Um, <laughs> you you just go by their voices, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's really really interesting because they do bring so much to it. Like you you, you have three actors read the exact same lines and put them on the exact same. Uh, you know, visual character, but they'll they'll seem completely different. Yeah, like if, if anyone else had been Kenny, I have no idea what we would have done this yeah, season. Yeah, for sure. But, thanks for asking that. Yeah, That's a great question. You. Oh, and uh, AJ, the '80s kid in me, thanks you for Marty. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. From the Marty in me. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Brad, and I actually live in Macon. Oh, cool. Sweet. So, wow. sorry that it looks nothing like Macon. <laughs> no, I, you did a pretty good that job. That drugstore is based on a drugstore in Miami. Place. Sorry. <laughs> no, you made it, You did a pretty good job making it a dump. Is it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's um, fine. Don't pay right, us. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know who's responsible for it, but um, I just wanted to say thanks for the like references. Chuck Sam. Jordan. I think, yeah, Chuck, Chuck Jordan, Jordan, who uh, yeah. some people who have played the Sam and Max games know he was the lead designer on Sam and Max, The Devil's Playhouse. He wrote a lot of season one and season two of Sam and Max and Strong Bad. He left Telltale, I think, to go work at Imagineering, Walt Disney Imagineering, which is awesome. God, best. <laughs> yeah. um, but we, we, we brought him back uh, in. He came in to help with story stuff and to do the, the original story for the second episode. But Chuck grew up in Georgia, so he knew oh, okay. a ton of stuff yeah. about, about that era. And era, it was really area. Yeah. Also, um, <laughs> Chuck left around the same time as Harrison Pink, who was the designer in episode three, and he's another guy who lived. Harrison Pink showed up. Like, yeah, Harrison. Yeah. Harrison showed up, uh, and Harrison lived in Savannah for a lot of his life as well. So we have, we've had two Georgia natives on the design team, which has been really helpful for trying yeah. to get things that's to feel cool. as legit as we can for. And I think that's cool. Yeah. Like it's like a lot of you know it's really hard to get games where it's just like I'm just going to make a direct reference to a place the way a show or a movie yeah, like would. when they reference yeah. the Cherry Blossom Festival or. Oh, I actually looked that up on Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. That was me. Yeah. I, I'm just sitting there like, I'm the guy. We have this thing called the internet. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm just sitting there like, I'm the one guy that got that, that knows oh, cool. it's a real thing. Yeah, know? but that's why you do it, you know? It's like, it, the game needs to feel authentic, you know? And that's just all the way through. Like, I, you know, like, from the characters to whatever, I just want it to feel like a real thing, you know? Right. And, I mean, but you could have easily just made up something or whatever, but... The, Oh, why? If somebody's already made it up for me. I'm going to yeah. steal it. You know? <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say So much work the other way. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My thank you was creepy. Thank you. Spoon. <laughs> it's a tick shirt. That's, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to say, I think uh, The Walking Dead game uh, is probably 
come together better than any of the other previous Telltale games that I've played. And I've loved the previous ones. I, think. I just you. think that this one is, <laughs> is no, no, it's, it's a good thing. You. It's firing on all cylinders, and I, and and I poker really night. like that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. What I wanted Take to ask me. is, what specific lessons have you taken away from previous games that you guys have done? that have informed this game? I think The Walking Dead was us taking every lesson from every game. Um, like, Sean and I weren't directly on Jurassic Park, but we were definitely watching Jurassic Park, and then a lot of our episode directors are from Jurassic Park. Uh, I worked on Back to the Future. When that was going on, we were working on Poker Night, um, and Sean and I were also working, we did a lot of work on the Puzzle Agent game. So, like, the Puzzle Agent games gave our art team a lot of experience with sort of getting that hand-drawn look to work in 3D. <laughs> Poker Night, uh, we learned a lot about weaving dialogue in with a bunch of, uh, of action inside of our engine because that's a game where four characters had to have conversations while playing cards, while someone is maybe busted out and someone is in, and all this other weird crap. Jurassic Park, um, we put a ton of work into, into our engine to hit the mark that we hit for Jurassic Park, which yeah, um, I, people have different feelings on that, obviously, but for The Walking Dead, we had so much at our disposal from that game, and also um, our animators and our cinematics team got a ton of experience with how to do action sequences through that. Yeah. Um, and then in Back to the Future, you can tell someone that your name is Michael Corleone and it remembers that across the season, so that helped us a lot. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that one, that was just one. You just sort of pick the things that are all working, and, you know. Yeah, and you also have your, like, you know, I'm a fan of our games, you know, I worked there, but like, I felt like it had been so long since I had shipped a game because I kind of like hopped a couple, so you just sort of like, you look at stuff and you go, man, when, I, when my number comes up, like, there's a couple things I really want to do. Yeah, you know? I think we, like, I've been at Telltale since uh, the second Bone game, and Sean, your, your first game, there was the third Walsh and Gromit episode. Uh, so we've been... Classic. We I, I think, <laughs> I'd say um, kind of our mission was to reinvent or modernize adventure games from day one. And every game we've ever done, up, you know, back to, like, Bone, Walsh, and Gromit, we've been pretty much trying to solve a single problem that we thought about with adventure games for that particular game. So Bone had a specific thing uh, it was trying to solve. Wallace and Gromit, Poker Night, uh, Back to the Future, Sam and Max, Monkey Island, uh, Jurassic Park were all very focused on, on one or two. So yeah, poking we, at very specific things. Yeah, what we <laughs> perceived as problems with um, modernizing adventure games. We've, we've Walking Dead is the first game that, that all of those things of kind of like, would, okay, we're going, we're going to the bucket list, and it's all going in this one. Yeah, and, and we're going to make it all about crazy Some of choices. it works. Yeah. I mean, there's still a lot that I think we feel like we've got a lot still to go. Like, we look at, I think we all look at Walking Dead and go, oh, God, <laughs> basically all the time. Yeah. But at the same time, like, we're all super proud of the stuff that's gone in there because it is the result of what is now, like, seven-plus years of us making a lot of, of these games. So um, the answer is everything. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Right. Thanks, Thank guys. you very much. Hey, um, hey, I wanted to ask about Lee and the fact that you've given him uh, a background component that's quite a big part of the story and impacts the dialogue choices, but it's not something that we as a player kind of understand about him yet and whether that was kind of, I mean, for me, it's, it's kind of the only point where I become slightly disconnected from Lee as a character. Um, and whether that was like something you're worried about, whether you thought of going down like the amnesia route or something like that, or just making him more of a blank character that the player just kind of imbued themselves on. Yeah, you know, that's a good question, uh, and I think about that a lot. And I think there, there was a couple things I wanted to solve. You know, I, I wanted Lee to have done something bad already, and it was really like personally, like this is like personal outside of sort of like the group discussion at Telltale, why we're gonna make the game, you know? And like, this is probably the first time Kevin's heard this, but for me personally, like, I was just curious if we could get people to come along, you know? And I think it's really interesting if you can get players to empathize and to carry the bag, to carry someone else's baggage. And that was just sort of a question for me. And I said, it looks like I have an opportunity to do that right now and people are gonna let me do it. It's like, okay, let's see what happens. You know, and um, it was never, it was never on the table to have, make a character. Then the amnesia route is just sort of like, you know, we, yeah, yeah, this wouldn't have been right at all. You know, it seems. Uh, I think for us, like we never even really talked about giving Lee amnesia or having to be a blank slate. But I think for us, if we had if we had decided this is a character who knows nothing about his surroundings, that would suddenly have to just be what the entire season's about. Because yeah. you, you can't do a game that is all about story and is all about player choice, but also 
it would suddenly just become the elephant in the room is, and this guy doesn't know who he is, and he's sort of trying to figure out who he is and what his past is. But that's not really what's important, because you're trying to survive in the zombie apocalypse. So he sort of had to say, eh, this is this guy, and the moment he kicks out the window of that cop car, he feels like his life has changed, and what he's going to do with that is up to you. And yeah, that was, a you know, we felt like giving him a fresh restart, like literally breaking out of the handcuffs in the cop car, like cheesy metaphor. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, like that was enough, you know, to really come along with him now. Uh, and, and you know, but like everybody's done bad shit in their lives. You know, everybody has regrets. You know, killed senators. Everybody just killed somebody. Like, you know, yeah, you know right? uh, but and I also didn't want the first time Lee kills a person for it to be the first time. I, it was just something I thought about a little bit. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting question as well as we figure out more about how to tell stories in this in the interactive medium. Because it's still very, very nascent. I think we're still kind of basically in like the silent movie era of figuring, figuring out how to do this. Um, and with there, I think you, you kind of take each project on its own merits, like whether or not it's best to create a somewhat fully defined character like Lee and then let players fill in the, like the last little touches through their choices, or do you create like someone that's more of a, basically kind of an empty vessel, like a Gordon Freeman who never speaks and doesn't, has no personality of his own, so the player can kind of fill that vessel with their own um, personality and kind of role playing a little bit within within the parameters of the game. We, I, when you when you're doing storytelling, like you have to define the character somewhat, uh, and then let the player hopefully kind of add their little tweaks through the choices they make. Also, we can let you you can not talk a lot if you want. It's yeah. Really yeah, you really can creepy. be Gordon Freeman. You <laughs> never have to really say anything. Weird. You speak something. Yeah, I'll speak when you're not around. But that, that's why yeah. we specifically describe the game as a tailored story. It's it's not you're not crafting every single aspect of it, but you're definitely steering the story along. Uh, Gary was the one who came up with the phrase a tailored. Story. You buy that suit and we make it fit you real nice, but you're not uh, creating clothes. From yeah, it's like yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, the point. analogy I use is the difference between like buying a suit off the rack and like having someone like a bespoke suit tailored for you. Because they, they, and, and this is going to sound kind of artsy fartsy, but I think if you really, if we do really, really do our jobs right, we sit around and I come in as a consultant and we all talk about what the story should be. But when we do our jobs right, I think we hand the story off to you in an unfinished form, and we say you finish it. Like you are now, you become the last creative collaborator in this process. We've taken it to like the last 95%, but it's just like if we were telling a, if we were doing a straight up TV episode, like we invite you to come in and say, well, what, where do you think, what do you think should happen to finish this episode out? You make those choices through the process of playing the game. And I think when we get it right, that's what it feels like. Yeah. All right, we're, we're, right. we're getting very close on time, guys. So let's make these answers as quick as possible so we get some, through some more guys. So yes, yes or no questions only now. Yeah. Okay, Go. so first off, the first time you ask, um, Clementine about the salt lick, and her response is maybe. That was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> I said that. I think that was cut out of a Playing Dead episode, but I was like, that's like, my that favorite was part. Yeah, yeah, awesome. At that point, I was really on the fence about her. I was like, mm, I don't know. And then I was like, I love her. Okay, she's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk to Clementine early on in episode three. Exciting. Also, oh, yeah. again with the salt lick, Whose idea was that? Oh, in man. the cooler. So that was Who actually. Who came up with the salt lick? I, I'm not going to say that I came up with it because I didn't. Oh, Jay, come no, on. I Don't be bashful. No, no, no. That actually came, I think, I think part of that came from Sean Ainsworth, who's one of the guys leading episode four. But um, that is one of the first things that existed before there was any story where like, you got to get trapped in a room with a huge dude with nothing to kill him. And then just like you find, just you fi pull a filing cabinet off the wall and bash his head in or something. So like, that, I don't remember where that came from, but that existed before the rest of the story. And episode two secretly was designed from that out in both directions. Yeah. Well, probably not secretly. There's like an old list of just sort of like cool scenarios of like things that can happen yeah, in a world we, like this. And that was on it. Yeah. And then Chuck was like, I think I found a place for it. What if... Paula Dean and her sons were cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it diverted from there. But that was the they trapped him in a meat locker, like, and listening. Larry gets bit. And, yeah. Or Larry doesn't get bit, Larry has a heart attack. And we're like, oh god, that's the episode. So yeah. that's where that came from. Yeah. As a kid who grew up in a small farming community, I've always wanted to do that. You've always so wanted the I was of like, kill him! It was great! Well, it's a like, it's so, so we got the guy from Bacon, we got the person who always wanted to bash in a salt Perfect, it was perfect. Good. Tailored. You. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I appreciate that unlike Rick, who's a good guy before the apocalypse and good guy after, or the white Peter who's beaten his wife before and after, or scumbag Nazi, that Lee is a guy who's done bad things for probably bad reasons, and you get to be him as a character and see if he becomes a hero or how, how he changes after the apocalypse. Um, and to that end, uh, Gary, you know Robert. Um, 
that will we see Lee or Clementine, assuming that they survive this ordeal um, in the comics anytime? Um, I, I can't speak to that because, you know, there's, there are business concerns and people way above me like Robert and, and uh, the, the guys at AMC that would, that would make those decisions. But I can tell you that we have geeked out internally about the kind of the fantasy of like Clementine yeah. showing up in the comics or in the TV show like, and actually have the crossover go back the other way. It's very nice to have Herschel show up in the video game or Glenn or whatever, but to, to feel like we are as legitimate, because I, I feel like we've earned it. I feel like it's, a, it's as legitimate an iteration of The Walking Dead as the comics or the TV show at this point. Yeah. And, so, and I think the greatest validation of that would be to have Robert to invite us or ask us to put one of the characters we created into his comic or in the TV show. You know, show. like Duff. We don't, yeah, like Duff. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, there's, 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 there's no way to know if that would ever happen, but I think I heard some story about like AMC were initially kind of very frosty about like our game at first, they didn't know how it might affect their show. But once the game came out, they suddenly started to get much more friendly when they realized how good it was. Um, so who knows what could happen, but certainly I, I think creatively we'd, we would be extremely receptive to that. But there's a lot of weird business yep. things that would have to happen for, for that to be real. That was a great question. Oh, though. thank no. you. We are I mean, I'd like to get into a point. Yeah, we sorry. got the that sad time yeah. sign. I'm sorry, we but again. before right. we go, as promised, everyone here gets an exclusive Walking Dead item as a thank you for your support. Uh, it's a poster that we'll see on the screen. No, maybe. <laughs> Well, you'll see it in your hand it's at this? some point. Yeah. Oh, you'll get this. You'll yeah. get a limited set. You'll get a. Yeah. That's a terrible poster. <laughs> oh, no. um, All of us looking that way. But it's um. extremely exclusive. You can only get it here right now at this panel as a thank you for showing up It'll and supporting outside. us. Yeah, it's out, they're outside. Uh, they're outside. Don't go there. Yeah. We'll meet you guys outside. Yeah. And each one is numbered. Even sexier, I know. There's a crowd. <laughs> thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time on Playing Dead. <laughs>